Welcome back to the show. We're here today with our second host call of the weekend, making sure that we get to at least a half a dozen of our community's questions each Saturday and each Sunday. So about a dozen for the weekend. Yesterday, we went through some great ones. Hopefully, you tuned into yesterday's show. That was episode 1891. So 1891, we went over uh, chronic urticaria. We went over dental cavitations. Uh, we also went over herbal teas and vitamin D that are keeping people up at night and why that might be. We went over some red light therapy. Uh, we talked about lab shipping and legalities around that. So we did a lot. So hopefully you checked out yesterday's show for all those answers. Uh, all podcasts, remember, are right on over at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. Okay. Today's podcast is at episode uh, Stephen, it's, uh, it's at stephencabral.com forward slash 1892 if you'd like to read along with the questions. First question today is from Joanna. Joanna says, hi, Dr. Brawl. What do you suggest to help with nausea during pregnancy? Is there something you should be doing preconception to prevent or reduce nausea while pregnant? Also, is there a link to histamine intolerance and nausea during pregnancy? And if so, what can be done for this? As I am someone who already has histamine intolerance, and I'm currently doing all I can to heal my gut, I am more likely to have nausea during pregnancy for this reason. Many thanks, Joanna. Okay, Joanna, thank you for the question. I have not seen a tie between hist high histamines and nausea during pregnancy. However, I can absolutely tell you that people with higher levels of histamine that leads to acid reflux or gut-based issues do have higher levels of nausea. So there is a connection there, okay? I have not seen pregnancy bring that on specifically, but if you already had it before, absolutely. Uh, higher levels of histamine in the stomach and gut, which are produced there, uh, absolutely lead to more nausea. No doubt about that. Okay. So I've done podcasts on this before, but I, I'm happy to answer your question right now. What to do for nausea during pregnancy? Okay. So one of the time-tested uh, things to use, I'm going to see if I can, I, I probably won't be able to find the um, actual podcast number while I'm looking it up right now, but let me see if I can find that. Let's see, just go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, type it right into there for nausea during pregnancy uh, I just don't have it right there. So I apologize, uh, but I'm going to give you uh, the answer again. So there's two things that I do. One is I use the time-tested Ayurvedic herb that has been used, again, for many thousands of years, and that's ginger. So typically what I have women do before the nausea even sets in is I have them when they wake up have either fresh ginger, and that can just be about a half a thumb of fresh ginger that's been peeled, and put that right in some hot water as tea, and you can sip on that, okay? Or if you don't have fresh ginger, you can just use ginger tea bags. The only issue in your case, Joanna, is that ginger is higher in histamines and it affects some people. Not everyone, it actually helps some people, uh, but it, it can be higher in histamines. So you be careful with that. The second is that during your first 12 weeks of pregnancy, there is a little bit of up and down in hormones. It's not quite balanced yet. And you need to make sure that those progesterone levels are high enough in order to be able to have a nice, strong uh, first trimester of pregnancy. So although we can't use a lot of herbs, which I don't recommend uh, while pregnant, um, there can be preconception, the ability to work on improving your estrogen to progesterone ratio. So for women out there that are thinking about getting pregnant and want to work on this ahead of time, I recommend the stress hormones, mood and metabolism lab. That's the best one to actually look at estrogen dominance and lower levels of progesterone. This is also one of the reasons why uh, morning sickness or it can be any time of the day or nausea typically does clear up right around week 10, 11, 12. All right, Joanna, so hopefully that was helpful. Also, a nice thing is ginger chews, the all-natural ginger chews, or even the Manuka honey ginger um, lozenges can be great for car trips or throughout the day. So Joanna, try any one of those three because uh, they've all worked for many women in my practice. Okay, Anonymous is up next. 
I can't explain to you how beneficial it has been to have a resource where I can ask questions and know that I'll receive a thorough, thorough, accurate, and unbiased opinion. Thank you and your staff so much for providing this. Thank you, Anonymous. In the last six months, I've had two outbreaks of cold sores that appeared in the same location on my upper lip. It has been approximately four months since the last episode, but the skin on this area of my lip continues to feel rough and often sloughs and peels. Additionally, I sometimes wake up in the morning with this part of my lip looking and feeling slightly swollen. I am an otherwise healthy 48-year-old woman who eats a primarily whole foods diet, exercises regularly, and feels great. It seems odd to me that this is happening, and I'd love to figure out a solution. Thanks so much. Okay. So we have the solution for you, and I would love you to go back, and this one I know I can find. So I'm going to literally go again to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, and I'm going to type in herpes. So let's do that right now. Um, Cold sores, cold sores are a form of herpes virus. And I know there's a lot of episodes where herpes has been asked about, but I'm going to find the one that I want for you. Episode 760, okay? So Anonymous, I want you to check out episode 760, okay? And I also want you to check out the episode on high arginine versus lysine foods. Okay, let's see if we can find that for you. Because high arginine foods could induce more cold sores in susceptible people, and high lysine foods will actually help reduce uh, cold sores in uh, many people. Hmm. Let's see if we can find it. If not, you can always ask if you can't find it at cabralsupportgroup.com. And I'm sure, Anonymous, that you're familiar with that. But at cabralsupportgroup.com, they can find you the, find you the podcast that shows the high arginine foods and the high lysine foods. All right. So let's just see, did I attach it to episode 760? That might be, uh, that would have been a wise idea as well. And we did not, but all of the different products are right there talking about, um, the immunity protocol, your zinc, your vitamin C, your colloidal silver, your grapefruit seed extract, apple cider vinegar, uh, your L lysine, all of that's in there. So definitely check that out and then ask Hey, where can I find the list on Dr. Paul's podcast of the high arginine foods versus slicing foods? And you'll want to reduce your arginine foods, not completely, but reduce it a little bit and then increase your lysine foods. All right. So, and then let me know again, you know, we're here. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, feel free to ask a follow up on that as well. Okay. Ryan's up next. How do you see health coaching in the future? in the future of primary care physicians. With the exponential rate of growth in technology, I can only imagine devices like the Aura Ring and continuous glucose monitors will quickly advance to be able to measure all sorts of physiological functions, toxicities, and deficiencies. Combine that with advancements in the internet, in the internet of things that is coming with 5G and is only going to continue to expand. Do you foresee the possibility of a simple wearable or implant being able to monitor hormones, vitamins, minerals, metals, et cetera, and immediately act on that data by automatically ordering what you need or even providing a, a relief itself? Where does the doctor of the health practitioner become relevant in some aspects? Okay. Ryan, great question. Probably way over uh, most people's heads. I hope not, but but maybe. Uh, but this is talking my language. This is the language that I research that I don't. I never speak on because when it's time to speak on things, uh, w- I will talk on this. And we are not there yet, but that is where my not not my my research is being done on this now. But that is where my practice and teaching will move in the future. It's a couple. It's, it's years away, but when it's there, I will have felt that I've given you everything I have for diet, for weight loss, for viruses, for autoimmune, energy, adrenals, skin conditions, you name it. So I'm creating these health results accelerators that you can find at stephencabral.com forward slash courses. And we're going to come out with one every couple months. And then, of course, there are thousands of podcasts that you can just search for your answer. So there's no doubt I'm never going to like, I'm not going to stop talking about these things. However, I will be shifting my focus to being able to help people to the highest level possible and at the speed of technology. Because what Ryan is talking about is the future of health. And it's it's going to make 
it's not going to make PCPs and health coaches obsolete, but as a health coach, you are absolutely going to want to understand and be able to utilize all of the different smart devices, such as continuous glucose monitors, which measures your blood sugar at all times, um, HRV devices, sleep devices, et cetera. I use all of them right now. I think they're fantastic. And it's actually going to be, you're going to need to be uh, working with a qualified practitioner because there'll be so much data and most of it won't be actionable unless you're able to read all of it together. And yes, there'll be lots of algorithms that help with that. So no doubt about it. I look forward to this. This is where everything is moving. It's a good five years away from its infancy. You could say it's in its infancy now, but it's all over the map. Honestly, it's all over the map. It's five years away, I would say, from its infancy and 10 years away from much more adoption and 20 years away from uh, being here. Now, based on Moore's law, uh, again, like in my free time, <laughs> this is I study technology. I'm certainly not an expert, but I love it and I study it. And um, based on Moore's law, we can be looking at uh, what, a doubling of this technology every 18 months or so. I know that's based on computer chips, but so are these rings and all that. And it could be it could be sooner. Honestly, there could be breakthroughs that happen sooner. I know a lot of these companies working on these things, and I go, I'm go i going off on a tangent right now. I'm looking at my time like, hey, this is a long answer. Um, 10 years is the minimum, and I would say 20 years the maximum, so somewhere within that time span. And I'll be there for the infancy in, in about three to five years from now for like early, early adoption. Yes, I know some people are using these things now, but they're not being used in any like quantifiable way. Okay. So, you know, your HRV, but like, what are you really doing to make it to, to like change anything? Okay. You know, your glucose, well, certainly you could change that, but are you really working with a qualified practitioner that knows how to use uh, magnesium and chromium and banaba leaf and all these different things? Do you, do they know how to use your intermittent fasting? Are you intermittent fasting for too long? So, uh, it's probably something I'll teach inside of IHP in another, let's say, three to five years from now, uh, because IHPs are the. I mean, you can go to integrativehealthpractitioner.org, integrativehealthpractitioner.org to see what we're doing. And I mean, I really believe that our institute, the people that make up this institute, are the future of health coaching. Uh, we're, we'll always be on the cutting edge with labs and with technology, and and uh, I'm excited. I really am because I love it. I really do, and uh, I look for that day to. Uh, to be here, not, not in the too distant future. Okay. Next question is from Ryan. Maybe the same Ryan. I have a friend who breaks out in a rash from sunlight exposure. I couldn't find anything from searching for podcasts. Uh, she says all she has found to prevent it is covering up with sunblock. It has always been the case, uh, but for a significant portion of life, could it be a histamine issue? Okay. So I've talked about this uh, multiple times. So let's type this in. We're just going to go and we're going to type in sun allergy at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. Um, and you'll see it on uh, 295, 540. That's corn allergy. Hey, let's type this in in quotations. Anytime you want the exact phrase, I'm going to type this in. Sun allergy. Okay. So that's not it. Let's type in um, allergic to sun in quotations. Now that's not it. We'll find this. We'll, we'll figure out what this is. Okay. So let's type in sunlight allergy or uh, photosensitivity. You just have to look for all these different ones. That's all. All right. Well, I searched the website. I know I've spoken on it, but since I couldn't find it, I absolutely do want to make sure that I answer your question. So it's absolutely possible that people are allergic to the sun. I know that that might sound strange, but um, in reality, they're not actually necessarily allergic to the sun, but their immune system is malfunctioning in a way that it is having a uh, histamine-based reaction or some type of cytokine-mediated reaction to sunlight itself. It's often called solar urticaria, which means that you get some type of either hives or welts or wheels or reddish rash. A lot of times the V area around the neck will get it. And what we do is, if they weren't born with it, and many people aren't, but if they weren't born with it, we actually run the big five, and we start to look at all the different imbalances within their body. So imbalances with like low levels of zinc, high levels of copper, low levels of vitamin C, so they're not able to reduce their um, 
their cytokine or histamine levels. We look at their gut function and we see oftentimes that there's candida overgrowth or low good gut bacteria. So then we start to work on the specific issues that we find are underlying imbalances to their immune system. Again, we're not looking at why is their body reaction, reacting to the sunlight. We're looking at is why is their immune system having this reaction? And we can look at that. So we can actually un begin to understand the underlying root causes as to why the immune system would become imbalanced. Because remember, some people might get joint pain. They might get a thyroid issue. They might get a nervous system issue. They might get a brain-related issue in terms of inflammation. And some people might have a uh, reaction to the sunlight. So they're all possibilities, but again, uh, run the big five or at least run some gut testing, the stool test, as well as the um, candida metabolic and vitamins test would be a great place to start. Okay, Lynn's up next. When doing a sauna, what supplement support do you recommend? Binders, electrolytes, vitamin C, are also, are there still benefits if one doesn't sweat very much? Okay. So there's still benefits to a sauna, even if you don't sweat a lot. However, it typically means that your body's dehydrated or your body is in a deeper, uh, the best way to say this, a deeper parasympathetic state, meaning that your body is in a, in a, in a healing state where you're not actually giving your body the ability to sweat. I'm gonna see if I can say that in a better way. So a lot of times when people aren't feeling well and they've been sick for some time, like I used to, you have a lowered metabolic rate. So you can actually take your temperature, like especially first thing in the morning, and it's in the 97s or even lower. And a normal temperature is somewhere in the 98s. It doesn't have to be a 98.6, but 98.2, 98.4, 98.6, 98.8, all of those are fine. But a lot of people are 97.2. You know, I used to be in the uh, low 97s, sometimes high 96s. And you can see that you're in that deeper parasympathetic lowered metabolic state, not a good place to be. So you don't sweat as easily. Now, as the body gets healthier, use the sauna more, don't be surprised if you start to sweat. Sometimes I've seen when I used to have my huge location in Boston, my functional medicine center, and this beautiful, you know, um, infrared, far infrared, near infrared, mid infrared, uh, sometimes take people eight sessions before they started to sweat. <clears throat> so um, that's something to look at. You still get benefit, still move circulation in your body. Um, people get, I believe that people are too overthinking all the different supplements they need to use with sauna. Just sweat, honestly. Just sweat. Use your daily foundational protocol level two or level three. Use the immunity protocol and just sweat. All those protocols right there, daily foundational protocol level two or level three, has all the electrolytes you need, has the vitamins, it has the minerals, it has the daily detox factors. You Use your functional medicine detox every quarter. Don't overthink this. Because the goal isn't to do a sauna like once every five weeks, the goal is to use a sauna as many times a week as you can, or to sweat as many times a week as you can. And you just don't need binders every time you sweat. Like that is just, it's not the case. Now, can you use, can you do a specific like panchakarma or big detox every 12 weeks or twice a year? 100%, right? So if you do a functional medicine detox and you're doing like more saunas and all those things, then use the intestinal cleanse. Um, so just go to equi.life and just type in intestinal cleanse that contains all of your binders and it will help bind things up during a deeper uh, like detoxification based protocol. So yes, but again, this is every day and you certainly shouldn't be using activated charcoal on a daily basis uh, or even bentonite clay, even though I think it's fantastic. But again, you shouldn't use it every day. I've given uh, many shows as to why, because it is a carcinogen. Okay. So Marco is going to be our last question for the day. Hey, Doc. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer our community's questions. Really appreciate it. Is there any reason as to why you use the product Paramine in your mold detox protocol rather than just regular omega-3s? I saw that the Paramine uh, product is just basically perilla seed extract, and this is one of the richest sources of ALA based on my research. Given that ALA is an omega-3 fatty acid, I was just curious, uh, why not just use the Equalife omega-3? Well, that's a great question. And the answer actually lies in the difference of what you are saying and we are saying as the difference. So I'm gonna actually give you the, uh, actually I can't give you the link, huh? Because these are all on, uh, on our pages after that. So let me see if I can find it for you. Uh, I probably won't be able to at this exact moment, but let me just try to give you the actual web page so you can look it up for yourself. All right. 
I know I'm doing a lot more looking up today, which I typically never do because I don't like there to be like kind of like dead ear space and all of that. Uh, but let's see here. Okay. So the paramine that we use comes from rosmarinic acid. So it actually comes from rosemary. So if you've never heard of the herb rosemary, it's absolutely fantastic to cook with. If you cook chicken, uh, if you ever have chicken, or even fish, cook with a little bit of rosemary. Powerful antioxidant, powerful herb. Uh, don't eat it, just cook with it. It's absolutely fantastic. Well, what we're using is the rosemary extract from that, and that is allowing us to work on mold specifically. So when you're talking about uh, the perilla seeds as you are, well, where are we talking about that for that as well? If you use perilla seeds specifically, then you're getting a herb that helps with the lungs and respiration. And we do know that many mold-based spores are gotten into your body through your nasal passages, through breathing in, and can actually lock into the lungs as well. So it's a great question. Uh, without a doubt, you should be doing the daily foundation protocol level two or level three while doing the mold protocol. So you get the higher dosage of the omega-3s, which is two grams a day, uh, two plus grams a day, especially higher in EPA. Although I like ALA as an omega-3, I would never use that as my only omega-3. Uh, and the reason is that it just has a poor conversion of between six and 14% all the way down to EPA and DHA. So that's, that's my reason because I want to get the clinical benefit. So that's it. So rosmarinic acid, uh, rosemary, great for molds. We get the perilla seed uh, with the lungs and respiratory, and then um, you can take your omega-3 separately. So <clears throat> Marco, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, luckily, I'm, I'm starting to get a little hoarse here today. So that is the end of our show right on time. Hopefully this week's episodes were beneficial for you. Of course, you can always share the shows if they are helpful and be sure to tune in tomorrow for a brand new Mindset and Motivation Monday. Take care, everyone. <laughs>